Pursuant to orders, senators, please resume your seat. Pursuant to orders, I now call Senator Shoebridge to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Shoebridge. President, for more than 2,000 generations, First Nations peoples have lived in this land, raising their children in culture and on country, according to law passed down through generations. And there's wisdom and power in this history that this parliament refuses to acknowledge. But I acknowledge it here, and I recognise the long history of First Nations-led resistance to violent dispossession and genocide. This place is on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, I was born on Darug and Garingai land, and my family and I live on, on Gadigal country. And everywhere in between and across this extraordinary land is Aboriginal land. And I look around this chamber and I see and respect the growing number of First Nations members in this place, including my two powerful Greens colleagues, Lydia Thorpe and Dorinda Cox. And I acknowledge that for as much as time means anything to us as humans. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. <clears throat> now, as Greens, we're here to do more than keep the bastards on us. Yes, we'll push this government further and faster on things that matter, on climate change, on integrity and fairness. More than that, though, we're here to change the system, to make it represent the many and not just the few. And you've told us what you care about, and we hear you. We're ready to make changes. We're ready to legalise cannabis. We're going to tax billionaires to deliver dental and mental health care into Medicare, and we'll fight to keep coal and gas in the ground. <laughs> Greens and MPs and senators aren't sent here by a powerful few to serve their interests. We, in fact, come from a proud history of protest, of resistance and grassroots activism. And as a member of the New South Wales Greens, I owe a particular debt to the Green Bands movement of Jack Mundy and the BLF that began in the 1970s. Jack, <laughs> Jack saw um, earlier Senator than Shubridge, most. Just a moment, please. I would ask the gallery to hold their applause until the end. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I think that's harsh, President, but I'll take it. <laughs> Um, Jack saw earlier than most how social and environmental struggles are inextricably linked. And I stood with Jack on that last successful green ban he was involved with to protect the beautiful Bondi Pavilion from destruction. And I learned from Jack. And Judy, Jack's partner in life and activism, Judy is here with us today. <laughs> Working as a young lawyer, I also had the opportunity to act for building workers and the construction union, part of Jack's old union. I saw directly how collective union action was essential to face down the threats to individual workers, to protect conditions, to uphold safety standards. And in that work, I had my first taste of real world politics. I acted for the union in the viciously anti-union coal royal commission set up by John Howard. And I was also sent in to oppose the then state Labor government's push to strip back workers' compensation rights, making it even harder for injured workers to live in dignity. And in fact, it was in that political stoush that I first saw Greens in action in Parliament. I saw Lee Rhiannon and one of her staff members, John Kay, listen to the concerns of working people, understand the history and go into bat for them when no one else would. And that was the early 2000s. And it was also a time of mass movements, mass movements against war, with hundreds of thousands of us marching for peace. And as we marched all across this country, this place ignored the calls for peace. And apart from Bob Brown and Kerry Nettle, barely ruffled a feather as Australia went off to another unjust war. So as a lifelong bushwalker, things were coming together for me. Social and environmental justice, peace and political action. I joined the Greens, and, and look what that's done. Uh, and in fact, it's remarkable to think that almost 20 years ago to the day, Kerry Nettle, 
delivered her first speech in this parliament as the first ever Green Senator in New South Wales. Thanks, Kerry, for all your work. And today, I enter the Senate as a Green and one of a record 16 Greens elected in this parliament. And I'm also part. <laughs> And I'm Senator, also um, part. Senator Shoebridge, oh, um, everyone in this place needs to respect the rules around the chamber, and I would ask uh, that applause be left until the end. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, I enter the Senate as a Green and one of, an, one of a record 16 elected Greens in this place. Yeah. And I'm also part of a growing global Greens movement. That's a movement of solidarity that sees our challenges collectively and realises we all shared this one planet, our only planet, and we better not stuff it up. So yes, for all those conspiracy types from the fringe right, it's all true. We do think and act globally, and then we act locally. It's all true. We're all in on it. We all have plans to replace cars with trains, bikes and ferries coal-fired power stations with wind farms and batteries, private with public. And then, when we have you distracted, we're going to sneak up behind you, tax a few billionaires, then socialise medicine by whacking dental and mental into Medicare. Yeah. It's just that, unlike others, we're conspiring in the open, and it's to save the planet, not to own it. I've always found that the more I am among people struggling for change, the more inspired I am to get into places like this and fight for the future. And I'm a believer in the renewable power. I'm a believer in renewable power, and my batteries are charged when I'm out amongst all of you, hearing your stories, gathering ideas, and being directed by people's everyday struggles for decency and justice. And I get this when I work with Don Craigie, Uncle Duck seeking justice for his nephew's death on rail tracks south of Tamworth. I get it working with grandmothers against removals, fighting for First Nations families. And I get it when I stand alongside survivors of institutional abuse to demand and then deliver laws that bend towards justice. And I get it when I work alongside the Barrowville families as they take on a racist criminal justice system that discounts the murder of their children. Their struggles should be Parliament's struggles, and as Greens, we'll make that happen. It's when we stand together and we look out for each other that we can really change the world. It's when we see how much we have in common. We don't divide ourselves. We look across the globe. That's when we're strongest. And in our struggle for justice, it's inspiring to work with communities across this country that share our values. And it's why I'm honoured to have members of the Kurdish community here, and I'm so thankful for their trust in the Greens and me. It's why I'm so thankful for the support from the Bangladeshi and Pakistani communities and from all those across the Indian diaspora who are in the gallery and share our values of tolerance, democracy and peace. And whether it's the struggle for Palestinian justice or Kashmiri or Kurdish self-determination, we know that human rights need to be seen as global rights and very much the business of this parliament. Yeah. On this land, First Nations justice must be core to all that we do. Yes, that's heritage and culture, but it's also taking action on incarceration, racist laws, economic empowerment and treaty. It means ending forced child removals. It means not locking up kids. It means truth and treaty and land back. No party can claim to be in favour of reconciliation and First Nations justice while supporting mandatory sentencing laws, expanding prisons, racist policing and child removals. I've seen this happening firsthand during my work in New South Wales Parliament. Just this year, I've seen New South Wales Labor flip from supporting to opposing a Greens bill that would have prevented racist child removals and empowered First Nations families and communities. And they flipped after a 20-minute talkback uh, talk radio spray from a right-wing shock jock. In that single backflip, broken politics mm. stole thousands of futures. That's the politics that keeps jailing 10-year-old First Nations kids in Dondale prison. That's the politics 
that strip mines First Nations land and ships the, ships the profits off to Switzerland or London or New York. This politics is deadly in all the wrong ways. We can't solve those problems by listening to the Daily Telegraph or the Herald Sun. We'll solve them by listening to the likes of Arnie Hazel Collins and her daughter Helen Eason. Because it was Arnie Hazel who taught me the truth about First Nations child removals. Hazel taught me how facts, then docs, then DCJ was taking the babies from her country. She taught me about First Nations mums in her town who still hide their kids when a white government car drives up. She taught me about the trauma to her family when their babies were stolen. And Helen, Helen, her daughter, well, Helen's taught me about strength and resilience. After years of disrespect and struggle, Helen's now running her own healing centre, doing what the government wouldn't, and she's got a whole family around her. Helen and Hazel and the many other First Nations people I've had the privilege to work alongside, <coughs> Helen and Hazel and the many other First Nations people I've had the privilege to work alongside have patiently taught me the strength, the power of the oldest continuous culture on this planet, who will never stop fighting for and protecting their families and their country. And that's a lesson this whole country needs. President, governments show us their priorities by who they shower with attention and cash and who they make wait. And in this country, young people, people on Centrelink, people with disability, First Nations peoples, peoples without a home, are all being told to wait. They can wait while a handful of mining and property billionaires are literally raking it in. And the next budget will see Labor and the Coalition joining together to hand out over $200 billion in stage three tax cuts to the super wealthy, like they need it. I see economic justice as essential human rights and justice work. And that means resisting the system that knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. The system that values forests only as wood chips. The system that accepts the state of your teeth as a marker of class. The system that takes homelessness and hunger as just a cost of doing business. The system that overfunds private schools and cheats public education. And the system that's literally devouring our planet and our future just for profit. Yeah, it's true that political decisions and loyalty have been bought by donations from big corporates and fossil fuel corporations, but it's also true that the loyalty of the political class in this country is with billionaires. It's with the billionaires with the self-importance of parliament, and it's not with the people. So let's change things. Let's see every billionaire as a policy failure, and instead of firing them off to Mars, let's tax them back to Earth. Let's stop hearing how we can't afford a safe, quality home for everyone, how we can't afford free early childhood education, how we can't afford to lift people out of poverty, how we can't afford action on climate change. We can, we will, and we must. And if we are to survive and thrive, then we don't have a choice. We need to keep coal and gas in the ground. This isn't a 43 per cent issue or a 75 per cent issue. The, silence, the science is telling us that for Australia, with its globally significant fossil fuel deposits, it's a 100 per cent issue. And after the 2019-20 black summer fires, I travelled around, around my beautiful state of New South Wales. I met communities in deep shock, surrounded by ash white and eerily silent forests. And it's the silence that still gets me, just these dead forests stretching on and on. And I saw towns sliced down the middle by fire. It was a window into our worst future. And more recently, the windows cranked further open as we've seen severe storms and floodwaters inundate Brisbane and repeatedly swamp parts of my hometown of Sydney and devastate, literally devastate towns like Lismore. This isn't normal. This isn't safe. If we get the politics right, it can be halted. And over time, it can be reversed. But if we get the politics wrong, this destruction's just the start. Now, that's one hell of a responsibility on all of us. 
The truth is, we are in a climate and extinction crisis and that our laws just refuse to acknowledge it. Our laws will put people in jail for graffiti but not for destroying an ecosystem. And that's literally cooked. Surely it's time to enact a new criminal offence of ecocide. Ecocide is the mass widespread damage and destruction of ecosystems and nature. It is, or at least should be, criminal where it's done by corporations or politicians or governments intentionally or recklessly. So instead of a short-lived Twitter backlash and a revolving door taking you from politics into a six-figure consultancy, if you're glad hand a fossil fuel project that screws our collective future, you should get 20 years in jail. That sounds more than fair to me. That's account accountability I'd vote for, and I'd backdate it to today. Saving the planet and delivering on fairness and transparency is surely going to require some serious renovation of this democracy. With the major parties' votes shrinking and a growing chorus of voters having elected Greens, Independents and minor party MPs to this place, they did that because they want a new style of politics that's focused on them, the people, not on us. And from my short observation over the last few days in this parliament, it still operates on a model of politics that's performative and combative, that's all about brand differentiation rather than delivering real change. It doesn't have to be that way. Talk of traditions and convention is already being used by government ministers as code to prevent us making this place more real, more accessible and ultimately more useful. Conventions are also being used to maintain the government's domination of the agenda and time in this place, in the Senate, which is bizarre when you realise they only have 26 or 76 members. It's just over a third. It's an equation that makes no sense to me. I'm hopeful that sometime sooner rather than later, these numbers will be used to provide far greater scrutiny, transparency and accountability of the executive. And last time I checked, that's meant to be a core job of the Senate. To my friends and mentors in politics, first of which is John Kay, um, we lost John in 2016. Uh, John was smarter, more principled, more hardworking than anyone else I've tried to keep up with. I chased him around state parliament for about five years and I still miss him. Having John's partner, Lynn Jocelyn, with us now, that holds that link for me. Thanks for coming, Lynn. And I acknowledge in the gallery three former New South Wales elected Greens, Lee Rhiannon, Sylvia Hale and Michael Organ. Lee, I can't thank you enough for your friendship, kindness, generosity and support. And Sylvia, Sylvia taught me about bravery in politics. I took her spot in the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever top Sylvia who a bit over a decade ago asked a notorious New South Wales property developer, Ron Medic, in budget estimates if he had any involvement in the brutal murder of his business partner, Michael McGurk. We all wanted the question asked. And I remember the united howls of outrage from Medic and all the other MPs when Sylvia asked it. But Sylvia knew about the New South Wales development industry and she knew she was right. And we now have that answer and Ron Medic is working his way through a 39-year prison sentence. So, I hope I can be as brave as Sylvia and Lee in my work here. And I also recognise Michael Organ as the first Greens member to win a seat in the House of Representatives. And Michael, it must be lovely to look across this building and see four Greens occupying the benches you first sat on, thanks to that Green slide. I also want to thank the team that ran an extraordinary federal election campaign in New South Wales. To James Ryan, Kilty O'Brien, Lucy Small and Aish Cowgill, who worked closely with me on the Senate run and all the statewide team. I owe special thanks to our amazing 47 lower house candidates. They worked for months on end, making direct contact with people, persuading them one by one how different politics could be. I owe you all my place in parliament and I hope to see a bunch of you join us here in three years time. To my New South Wales parliamentary friends and colleagues from across the political spectrum, but especially to Abigail Boyd, who's here tonight, thank you for your comradeship. And to be honest, I have a bit of FOMO as I see my former committee, 
the Public Accountability Committee slicing through the latest New South Wales parliamentary jobs for mates scandal. But I also see how the structures we built together in the New South Wales Parliament over the last 10 years are working to force accountability on an unwilling government. And I can tell you whatever else it is, New South Wales politics sure is a masterclass in scandal, corruption and abuse of power, lessons that will certainly come in useful here. I think laughing's disorderly too. Um, my thanks too to the unsung heroes of New South Wales politics and the now hundreds of Greens councillors I've worked with. Thanks for every tree you've saved and planted, for every park you've protected, every solar panel you've installed, every meeting you've suffered through and every resident that you helped. As a recovering councillor myself, I see how that work underpins Greens politics and I thank you for it. And I also want to thank the many members of the Greens, especially those here today, your trust keeps me going, and I can always count on you to keep me busy and to loudly call me out when I inevitably stuff things up. Thanks to the party. Thanks to the members. Thanks to the movement. And to my brother Michael, his wife Margaret, and my nieces and nephew, Gabrielle, Leah and Dominic, all this travel to Canberra has one big silver lining. I'll be able to spend more time with all of you, and that's a genuine blessing. My mum's also in the chamber. Thanks, Mum. Means a lot to me. Dr. Sang, my father in law, my daughter's stylist, Gung Gung, is also in the gallery, just as he's been everywhere else when we've needed him. And to Chi, who can't be here but's watching at home with Lester, thank you for your love, your support, and countless, uncountable, delicious dinners. You both help make our little Sydney family very, very special. to my lifelong partner, Patricia, and my daughters, Jessica and Hannah. You keep all of this in perspective. I can't imagine life without you, and I love you all more than fits in any one speech. To my amazingly talented oldest daughter, Jess, who's stuck at Camp Willara doing her HSC trials. Jess, I'm sorry about the timing, and I promise to make it up to you, and you will smash it. Han, my number one youngest daughter, you are funny, bright, generous and talented. In short, you take after your mum. <laughs> and Patricia, thank you for being here today and the years of support, love and grounding. I'm sorry there weren't more facts in this speech, but here's one big fact. You, Jess and Han are far more important to me than any of this. And when I'm working here, absent from you all, it's because of you and it's for you. So now it's time to turn those shouts of joy and those whoops of delight that followed the election, turn it into action and make this place live up to the democratic promise. Because we have a planet to save. So let's get started. Yeah.
just call it, you call it back on.